Hey, feel good fathers. Welcome to the show. Today I have a great guest. This is Aaron Tarr of, um, I know it's fierce. What is it? The fierce membership. So fierce and flourish is the programming be the benchmark is the actual name of my business because I came up with the business name far before I came up with my true branding. If that makes sense. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so great. And, and we had a great chuckle, uh, off air and we were talking about, intentionality and, and being a parent. And I've had, uh, had this, it's been like a little bit more than a year. So I've known Aaron and, and been helping her in the brand strategy capacity um, over the past little bit. But recently, she really sort of blew my mind as we were working on her next IP, her next set of content. And it had to do at a high level um, with uh, decisions that we help our children make. And so Given that introduction, Erin, can you give us a brief introduction to what we'll be discussing today? Absolutely. So the philosophy, the framework <laughs> to, to however you want to describe it is my social sweet shop. And it's really a idea of how to help kids and a metaphor for helping them understand all of their relationships in their lives, whether it's with uh, siblings or friends or parents or teachers. And where do people fit? Because in this day and age, I blame Facebook mostly. We call everyone a friend, which is a beautiful thought, but it doesn't distill down the granularity of how we interact with different people in our lives and what kind of uh, closeness we have to different people in our lives. So I really wanted for my kids and for my clients to help them understand that not all friends are created equal. And we need to think about that uh, as we grow and change and make decisions about our time and our priorities and our trust. Mm. So what is what are the different categories? So there are five different categories. The the one that we all want to think of as friends when someone when a child comes to me and says I don't have any friends, what they're talking about is this category, double chocolate cake friends. Someone that I know I can call up at a moment's notice that I can trust with my deepest darkest stuff uh, that has been there for me through thick and thin. When most people say they don't have any friends, that's what they're talking about. Then there are Rice Krispie friends, which is kind of a layer down from that. And these are the people that we spend a lot of time with, but we're not really intimately connected with. So that's your softball team or your math class because you see them every day for an hour or your youth group that maybe you see once a week at church. Uh, those, those are your uh, Rice Krispie friends. Then you have your Jelly Bean acquaintances. That's pretty much everybody. <laughs> Anybody that you know their name, that they know your name, that you might, you know, nod at in the hallway or say hi to or share a smile with, that's going to be your jelly bean. The reason that I literally came up with the social sweet shop is the next category, and that's the sardine brownie friendships. These are the ones where uh, science calls them ambivalent relationships, and science also says that they are the most stressful type of relationships for all people, regardless of age, where sometimes it's really great and sweet and wonderful, and sometimes it's really salty and nasty, and you're never quite sure what you're going to get. Mm. And navigating those relationships is really was really the impetus for the genesis for coming up with this entire social sweet shop. And last but not least, you have your just straight up sardines, and those are your enemies. And for most kids, by the time I talk to them, I can convince them that you probably don't actually have very many enemies. Enemies, enemies. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're, we're, we're channeling our Finding Nemo here. It's like, where's, where's the broken fin? <laughs> exactly. Uh, I usually say those, these you find in the comment section. Those are people who only ever want bad things for you. And most people don't have them unless you're really like, <laughs> really looking for it. So uh, I get to help kids understand that people that are hurting you or people that are making you feel less than usually are not truly your enemy. Usually they have issues of their own. They're really just a jelly bean or a sardine brownie uh, trying to navigate their own world. So it helps. I think this framework also helps them to grow in compassion for other people. Ideally. <laughs> I, I hear you there. I love, I love this idea from the the friend and navigating sort of the social group perspective. Are there any, uh, where would we, where would we put like parents in here and like, what are the, so we're, cause we're uniquely talking about kids yes. and where would we layer in sort of the, the more familial relationships? So up until the age of 10 or 11, 
you are your kid's double chocolate cake friend. They know no different. You, They trust you implicitly. You know everything. And then between the ages of 11 and 13, because of their own brain development, they start to be able to pull back the curtain and realize that adults don't know everything. Right. <laughs> and that's when the true work begins of, as an adult, helping your kid be able to continue to trust you at that double chocolate cake level. You will always be a Rice Krispie because they live in your house. They interact with you on a regular basis, whether that's a positive, yummy Rice Krispie versus a negative, <laughs> sour filled. I mean, and I think a lot of teenagers that I talk to would categorize their parents as uh, sardine brownies because they walk mm. in the door after school uncertain. Am I going to get yelled at for my socks on the floor? Am I going to get yelled at because I didn't do my chores? Am I going to get grilled about my grades? They don't know what's coming. Or are they going to just greet me with a big hug and a snack and just want to hear about my day regardless of what happened? Got it. So the framework, I, I love this. So the framework is really the individual's ability to categorize and look at the people that are around them and decide uh, for them, sort of what kind of boundary they're putting in place between that person or not. So if they are a sardine brownie, yeah. where they're uh, um, unsure of the interaction, and, and for the Feel Good Fathers listening, I really absolutely suggest listening to, as a companion to this interview, the Dr. Jenny Prohaska interview on trauma, because it really sounds like not saying that everybody has trauma because most people just have drama. And, <laughs> but for those of us that do have trauma, one of the ways that uh, people deal with the trauma is that they have, um, they lose that ca capacity for emotional control. And so as a parent, it's like when we lose that capacity for emotional control, because we're going through our own things. And typically as a father that reacts uh, because men project emotion outward uh, and women tend to project emotion inward and, and own, uh, have a more internal relationship with their emotions. Whereas men have a more external relationship. Um, common, common sentence from men is like, look what you made me do. <laughs> right. You made the, me do. Yeah, not, not the great <laughs> sentence, but ultimately it's like, if, if we are number one, if you have legit trauma, please go see somebody and ha have it taken care of that, that work always pays off. Number two, if it's just drama, find a better coping me mechanism and be that sit that space because one of the measuring capacities for you as a father moving down the line is, do you have a relationship with your kids' kids? Because if you don't have a great relationship with your kids, they will not extend that relationship to their kids. Um, okay. So that was, um, I love that because the, I think from the, um, and then I think the final thing I want to say here, because I'd love to hear your take on it is that. In feel good fatherhood, we believe that you do not need to continue mm -hmm. the emotional or generational emotional journey. And so See? if you had parents where they were sardine, I'm looking at my notes, <laughs> jelly beans or sardine brownies or mm -hmm. even Rice Krispies or literally sardines, um, that's basically going from common, from, from like common regular interaction to acquaintance to an ambivalent positive and negative. Mm -hmm. um, and then starting to be an enemy that if your generation, your upward generation was that to you, that you can make a different choice and move towards a different relationship with your kids. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, I would love to hear your take on that. Absolutely. <laughs> Cycle breaking is the foundation of why I started my business, understanding and having grace for generations that came before and what happened, recognizing they did everything they could, the best they absolutely could, and that that's not something that I want to repeat. So as a parent, one of the things that I've come to understand is my kid will be a sardine brownie because you don't know what you're going to get with kids. <laughs> when they come home, you don't know what happened all day. You don't know how they're going to react to you. You could do the exact same thing every single day. Say, hey, sweetie, how was your day? You know, whatever. Uh, although that's a horrible question to ask when kids get in the car, just for the record. There are a million better questions you can ask. What's a better question? Who did you sit with at lunch? Was your teacher funny today? 
I, I typically try and say something like, what was your favorite part of the day? Yes. Um, I have been doing uh, with my oldest, who's in sixth grade, I have been doing, what did you learn today? And that's been, that's been a landmine. That's been a landfield. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to say. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, uh, cause typically, typically it's just like, I didn't learn anything and it's like, okay, you just don't want to talk about anything. Right. Um, but I mean, uh, random I, things, even like who was absent from school today can generate a conversation and not mm -hmm. feel in any way adversarial or, uh, pointed towards the kid, you know, and that's how you want to open up conversation. Uh, is there, is, are, is there a difference between daughters and sons? I wouldn't know because I am one of three girls and I have three <laughs> daughters of my own. I do think, yeah, I think it has less to do with daughters and sons and more to do with personality, just, you know, okay. whether nature or nurture and just the relationship between those particular parents, because what my kids will tell me is far different than what they will tell their dad or how they will tell their dad. It's very different. And that's um, super real. <laughs> that's super real. So that is what that is. Uh, but. Kids are tricky, and I feel so blessed to have so much child development in my back pocket as a educator. So my background is in secondary education history. I took a lot of child development, a lot of child psych. I worked in school, so I saw a lot of different ways that kids grew and changed in different understanding all of that and the psychology and their brain works and all these types of things. And I understand not all parents have that. Most parents don't have that. They're specialized in computer science or being a doctor or whatever, you know, so they don't necessarily have that same understanding. And so when I am upset about something that my little sardine brownie friend has done, and by sardine brownie friend, I mean my child, <laughs> <laughs> I have to continually remind myself that I'm the adult with the fully formed brain. So I get to be the bigger person. Now, when they're interacting with their starting bratty friends at school, how I help them navigate that is usually just by setting really strong boundaries and saying, you know what, when they're acting a certain way, you need to remove yourself from that situation. That's not always the exact same advice as a parent, although sometimes, especially with teenagers, it is. <laughs> Sometimes you do just need to give them space. They need to understand. But when they're younger specifically, you're still helping them process those emotions. So as an adult with your own triggers and issues, your first instinct might be like, well, if you're going to act that way, just get away from me. And that does not break the cycle of helping them sit with their very real emotions process those feelings as completely normal and valid and useful because when they recognize it, then they feel safe and then they don't have to do all the things that are unacceptable. Before so, we, before we get, because this is, this is evoking a, another conversation that you and I have had uh, before we, before we get back to the sweet shop, yeah. I remember once we talked about, uh, it was something like what's real or what's true. Yes. There was like, there was a breaking apart of like, what, what happened, what my opinion is of it, or the what facts, can you, can... The feelings and assumptions. Yes. That's it. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one. So uh, when anything happens, yes, we as adults sh can and should take that pause to be like, what are the facts of this situation? What are just the solid facts? No one can deny, you know, the dishes did not get done this morning. That is a fact. Everyone knows that. My feelings about that are <laughs> that I have told her multiple times that her responsibility is to have the sink empty every night before she goes to bed. Now she's coming home from school 12 hours later. I could make the assumption that she doesn't respect me, that she doesn't respect this house, that she doesn't want a phone, that her friends are more important, that she's shirking all her responsibilities. I can write myself a whole little story, but really it's just the fact. And if I stay curious and say, Hey, I know we've had this conversation. I know you know the expectation, what's going on? Instead of adding all my feelings and assumptions, I can go down that road by myself. Mm. But then when I come to her, my little sardine brownie friend, <laughs> I need to lead with curiosity and just say, hey, this is the fact. What are your feelings and assumptions? And not be offended by her feelings and assumptions. Are you typically, so as a parent to a parent, yeah. 
I know for me, like my typical goal in those interactions is to drive to some sort of resolution. And so my intention is always to make it a little independent person. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I, I want to engender that responsibility, that sense of ownership, that independence, uh, uh, that pride, you know, like just that pride and like, oh yes, this is, you know, and so I've started recently saying like, Hey, uh, when she does great things, you know, I'm like, yes, it's wonderful that you've taken care of the house. This is your house as well. While you're here, like just kind of just building that sense of like, Hey, um, it's not from the paradigm of you're staying in my home as the parent, which I think is kind of weirdly abusive. Uh, but I think it's more like, Hey, like, this is also your home. This is your family home. That's your room. It's your space. Uh, and I, I think what I'm trying to, I think now that I'm talking, cause I'm, I'm working through this out verbally with you on the pod, <laughs> is, uh, I think what I'm trying to have her understand is there's your private space, which is your room. Like, and then she has a, she has her own vanity. So her own little bathroom. Mm -hmm. And so there's kind of like a upkeep of that space, which is like, Hey, like you want to live in a little bit more clutter, like more power to you, right? There are certain rules around that, like with guests and stuff like that. Uh, but then when it comes to public spaces mm -hmm. that it is equally maintained. And of course, like baby, baby young one is not, is like baby young one is the typical tornado, right? She's creating the mess, but it's up to us all to either take care of watch or, or contribute in some, some manner or capacity. So going back to then your example, you're engaging with this, say a tussie or with what's happened or with this, mm -hmm. this chore, not complete mm -hmm. with their facts, feelings, and assumptions. But I think now that I've, I've gone, now I'm coming back from the wilderness <laughs> in my conversation, it's what are, what kind of, what kind of results are we looking for here? Or is it simply conversation? I think it's always a good idea to go into a conversation, a potentially crucial conversation, critical conversation with some idea of what we would like to have happen. Because I think when we go bull first, you know, like head in and think, I'm just going to make sure that this, you know, conversation happens. It's like, eh, we don't necessarily handle it as well. I think at the end of the day, my conversation always is for how can our relationship be stronger after this. So whether or not the pot gets cleaned, <laughs> whether or not the right. dishes get done, whether or not the the there are things that I want to have happen only in the context of our relationship being strengthened as well. And you could take that very easily to the one end of like, well, I end up doing everything then because then everyone loves me. And that's not doing them a service because they also need to be responsible individuals. And our relationship is only going to be good if I'm raising strong, responsible, healthy individuals. And if someone's doing something for you all the time, you are not a strong, healthy, responsible individual. Right. You're a baby who everyone takes care of all of the time and you expect them to take care of you all the time. So. Yeah, it's it's that balance of, I mean, and wow, literally I told somebody the other day, I'm like, if you are tired, it's because parenting is the hardest thing that you have ever done if you're doing it right. Yeah, there's no there's no real consequence <laughs> when it comes to like I've 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 slowly come, you know, in, in feel good fatherhood world, I've slowly come to the realization that the, there there really is no consequence, like in the in the way that we understand it, you know. Um, I, I played a lot of sports growing up. I played both hockey and football and I was in theater and, and, and in school, there's legit consequences, right? Like you don't do your homework, you, you, you bomb, you, you, you goof off for the semester or whatever. Um, you get a bad grade, like yeah. there's a consequence, but at home it's like, all right, there's some poor feelings. <laughs> like you might get in a spat, you know, it's kind of like, it's more the it's, it, it becomes situ it, it, it can quickly go like the consequences. Typically it goes from an emotional state. Um, I apologize, a situation to a state. Mm -hmm. um, I'm obviously working out this framework in my head. But of, this of is also to... why we end up with adults who push themselves into their job and don't spend time on family because you get awards and accolades and praise at work for all the things that you do. Right. And while there's no consequences, there's also no, especially immediately. 
Your kids yeah. aren't, you know, your, your baby's not telling you like, oh, you're such a great daddy. Thank you so much for like changing my diapers and taking care of me. You're not yeah. getting that. It's all this feeling of self-efficacy and the real payoff is 20 years down the road. And we live in a microwave society who can't wait for that payoff. I, so I love, I thank you so much for coming here because I've been really working through how do we, uh, how do we navigate that journey from the external validate? Not, it's not validation, but please forgive me listeners and, and you for, for this word, the external validation to an internal validation, because part of facing the family, that's the feel good fatherhood way. And particularly when it comes to changing diapers, I've been, I've said this tons of times, like with, with my wife, I've, I haven't quite said it yet to my oldest daughter yet, but there are, there are things that I, cause I think about it. There are things that I don't particularly enjoy. Like I don't like, and I don't think anybody likes cleaning a poopy diaper. Yeah. I, it's not fun. It's there's, there's a ton of reasons why it's not fun, but the reward, right. Cause you were mentioning, Hey, there's no legit reward, but I think that there are, um, there are, there are long-term effects. So for instance, um, you know, with, with young one, it's like, there's a comfort and a pursuit that she'll come to me for certain things. There's the look on her face. There's a twinkle in her eye. There's the, you know, there's the innate trust, you know, when I'm carrying her to her crib to put her down for a nap or put her down for the night, right? There is, I, I can say there legit is a emotional response in me to what's happening. Yeah. And there is a, a, a sense of a reward, um, much like not an accolade. Like I wouldn't stamp it on the wall and be like, yeah, she looked at, I wouldn't take a picture and be like, look, she looked at me with trust. You know, I wouldn't, maybe, I don't know. That sounds like a neat idea, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but there's no, there's no overt reward for that. But I think that part of, I think part of the difficulty in navigating these different, the difference between like the career, the pursuit, the school, right? Like the school of the world is you do a work, you make more money, you know, you add more value, you make more money. Like you get that you're increasing the scoreboard of life versus the, in the house scoreboard is like, do you have peace in the home? Do your, do your kids, you know, I, we were talking about the, the relationship, you know, I think that and and here's the the one thing that I wish more moms understood mm -hmm. is that men are driven by respect mm -hmm. and they will bend over backwards if you say I respect you mm -hmm. or you're doing a good job or you're a good father. Yeah. If you do that acknowledgement, they will respond infinitely more positively to you yeah. than if you say I love you. Yeah. And it's it's important. Um, and then, you know, we're both Christians. And so kind of from the biblical perspective, you know, men, fathers, we're responsible for bringing the love in the house. So we lead with that. We bring the love into the relationship. That's our responsibility. That's a direct command from, from J dog. Right. <laughs> so he's asking us to do that. And, um, you know, because there's, and we don't have to navigate any, any of the rest, but the core element and principle is that I think that when I think of the father getting triggered from like the chore not being done. And as I'm talking this out, it's like, what, what's triggering me is, oh, she doesn't respect me. She's not listening to what I'm saying. Ah, and I'm just kind of like, well, no, it's probably just, and I, and because I know this of my old, oldest, she's just a kid. She would like, yeah, of course she'd rather go talk to her friends or paint or do anything than do a chore. <laughs> you know. So uh, uh, this is, this is really, really fascinating. So just to kind of sum up, right, we're in the facts, feelings, and assumptions. These are direct, and these are, it's not just the principle here. These are direct, like, what happened? What are the facts of the situations? How do you feel about it? How do I feel about it? And then we, we haven't yet talked about assumptions yet. So what, what is the assumption side? So Brene Brown says it this way, the story I'm telling myself is. So leading very clearly, if you're discussing this with, this is just a story I made up. I'm making up this story. I'm totally admitting that I'm making up this story. And then someone else gets to make up their story. And then you kind of see where they intersect or where they don't, or, you know, what's going on there. What are the stories that we make up? And normally we do all of this in like three seconds. We do this in a split second and we don't recognize it. And that's where so much conflict comes from. I mean, in life, but definitely with our kids and with our spouses. Yeah, I'm thinking about some of the, definitely some of the personal development work that I've done that a, a huge part of that has been to 
simply remain in the present because there's nothing there's nothing quite like watching or being a part of an argument where it's like two past people fighting from the past which is not changeable because it's just like but you know it's like or or into the future or fighting about what you know i guess fighting about the future is actually pretty good um (laughs) Uh, that's it, that's a good like creating fighting about creating the future. That's actually a really good fight to have, um, <laughs> or disagreement, or argument, or discussion. Right, whatever whatever language we're going to use around that, um, and language is important. But there's nothing quite like watching two people fight from the past. Oh, well, you did this when you were four. What? What's your kids going to say to that? Like, right, <laughs> exactly. Going, uh, You've uh, always always is one of those words. It's like. Mm. I, I actually said this to my nine-year-old yesterday because she's like, always. And I said, ooh, do you think always was the word that you meant to use there when referencing, I think it was something about my attitude. And she's like, mm, maybe not, maybe sometimes. And then whatever word, oh, I was saying angsty. How often am I, am I angsty? And then I was like, and what does angsty mean? She's like, I don't know. I said, then how would you know whether I'm always or sometimes angsty? <laughs> <laughs> so all that to say, language does matter. Absolutely. <laughs> I love that because I have that I have that literal discussion all the time with my oldest. It's like, well, you're using that word, but what do you do? What do you think that word means? <laughs> you no, know what? I think that word means what you think it means. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. Uh. Love it. I, I love this little exercise because I think it's it's you know they're they're coming in. Typically, I I I love the I love the acknowledgement that as our kids are in middle school and in high school. They're figuring out how to build their social network. They're figuring out, and that's that's a literal thriving and surviving mechanism. That's gonna be built into everybody, and they want that. So they're gonna treat, they're gonna be, they're gonna become our starting brownie for us. And, and as they enter their rebellion, as they they figure things out, as they assert their independence, it's and normal kind of and it's good. <laughs> Nor- yeah, you're right, normal and good. And so if we understand. And we we accept that principle that for us they become a sardine brownie that allows us to navigate and show them not only I think what we want because I think as the father I definitely want the respect because because our goal in the feel good father community is peace in the house like what I want is peace like it's like I don't don't want the fights like. Just come in, something's bugging you, great. You know, take take some time in your in your space, then come out when you're ready, kind of thing. Right. So, but are should we be endeavoring mm-hmm. to be to to increase that? Should we be endeavoring to increase that, like uh increase? I mean, like moving up to the delicious chocolate, right? The double chocolate mm-hmm. cake or the rice crispy treat. Like, should we be endeavoring to to change the relationship? Or is this simply a stay in here, accept the accept the relationship as it is today? I think when we handle, this is the gift that we get to give our kids. When we handle sardine brownies, when we handle them uh, in a healthy way, they naturally do become double chocolate cake friends over time mm-hmm. because they see that we are consistent and we are honest because when you have trust. So I tell people, so for example, there's a lot of double chocolate or sardine brownie is mean girl, right? So Sometimes they're really kind to you. Sometimes they're really not. And if you are able to model to them, because let's face it, they depend on you for everything. (laughs) Right. So you are able to model to them a healthy way to handle these sardine brownies to be able to say, I recognize that right now you are not treating me with respect, or I don't feel like you're treating me with respect. So Based on that, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not trying to change you because that's what boundaries are. Boundaries are not about changing the other person. They're about saying, because I'm not feeling respected right now, I'm going to go, you know, process my own emotions. And then I would love to talk to you about this later and see if you've come to any new conclusions about how we can resolve this. Mm -hmm. And in an ideal world, you'd be able to do that with every starting brownie in your life. But the reality is, it doesn't really, ha- I mean, at work, that doesn't happen. Um, in social circles, that doesn't happen. Everybody just brushes it under the rug or pretends it doesn't happen or stops being friends, right? But if you want a lifelong relationship with this person, you get to gift them with the healthiest possible way to handle people who are a little prickly sometimes, who are inconsistent, who have just different experiences of life growing up. And when you do that consistently and provide that safe, unchanging, and make no mistake, 
just because I came up with this does not mean I do it by any stretch of the imagination perfectly. Please don't interview my children tomorrow. <laughs> I, 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 I think we can all forgive that idyllic, <laughs> idyllic behavior is, is nonsense. Uh, but this, what, what's really interesting for me here is we're talking about a person who is developing more emotional capacity. And, and I love that, you know, when there are, you know, it's, I love, uh, it was in, is it inside out. Yeah. I think it's inside yeah. out the Disney movie, right? Watching, watching as Riley is, is hitting maturity and expanding the emotional capacity where it's like, as a child, it's like they're in one emotion and that's the state that they're in for time. Right. And I think it's like, there's the four it's joy, sadness, d oh, anger. disgust, fear, anger, right? So there's five, right? So there's the five. Um, the five emotions, but then over time, I guess there's still the five emotions, but then once they hit that more maturity, it's about combining them into new emotional states. Right. Yeah. And so that that's challenging to navigate. And I, and I want to use that capacity because I heard this recently and I think that for the feel good fathers, this is really important to understand when we are single men, we probably have about a hundred points on the scale like probably like plus 50 minus 50 as far as like our emotional range okay. we get an so somebody that we're spending a dedicated time usually this is for us this is getting married mm -hmm. i would say you might double that capacity you might get to plus 100 minus 100 in the same way that our children when they hit maturity are mm -hmm. learning to deal with their capacity mm -hmm. i think that when you become a father your capacity goes infinite positive and negative and that's challenging for, a, you know, for somebody that uh, for typically we have, we do have a stunted emotional range and, um, and I, it, it's weird. Cause I don't actually think, I don't think stunted is the right word here. I think it's just, there's a limited capacity we're doing, we have a different goal in life, mm -hmm. but once we become parents, mm -hmm. once we become that father, there's a shift in what's happening for us. And, and that infinite up and infinite down is difficult for us to navigate just as much. So that, that, that perceived slight from your sardine brownie coworker, which is annoying, mm -hmm. might when you're a father, like from your kid, that same thing mm -hmm. becomes a sign of disrespect, yeah. right? Or, or just like the range is different because I don't think, and here's the, here's the truth of it is that um, I think as parents, giving our full emotional range to everybody, which I think is the point of your sweet shop mm -hmm. boundary thing, like giving your full, and I'd love to hear your take on this, mm -hmm. giving your full emotional range to everybody in your life is, is a recipe for complete failure. <laughs> so failure, disaster. That is never the goal. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's, we start when we're treating starting brownie friends, like double chocolate cake friends, or when we're treating every jelly bean, like a double chocolate cake friend, we're going to be exhausted. We're going to be tired. We're going to be mentally unstable, <laughs> honestly, because that's, it's literally just not possible. And they've done studies on this. You know, this, you know, this is not me coming up with some random thing. This is legitimate studies that they've talked about how many people you can actually stay close to actually have close relationships with actually care for at a deep level. Yeah. I think that number, uh, I think it's the Dunbar. I think it's a Dunbar yeah, number. That's right. Um, and, uh, I, I might be, 150 I know it's, 190 I know, people total in your life. Yeah, the, and I think that's the that's like even down to sardines. Like that's the full range of folks. But I I, I definitely think it's like a limited number of like the chocolate brownie cakes yeah. as we get older. And this is actually a, a sign of um a, a legit sign of uh uh longevity, right? Mm -hmm. So feel good fathers, we want to be around for a long time longevity, having more than one or two. And they and these chocolate double chocolate cakes can be in different capacities. So for instance, you could have, I have my best friend. Yeah. We connect all the time. I've known my, I will, I will know my best friend longer than I know my wife. <laughs> it's like, yeah. and that's just, but they're completely different levels of, yeah. of, of friendships, even though, you know, both my wife and he are double chocolate cakes. Right. Typically I would say there is usually a mentor or usually another colleague. Like it's good to cultivate more of these relationships. And what we're hearing here, and I think what the overall discussion is, how do I, as the feel good father, because I love talking about this from teaching our kids how to do the boundaries. Mm -hmm. But when I heard about this, I was like, aha, 
here is this really great mechanism I can use to navigate and build a much better and more intentional social circle for me as a feel good father, yes. because what we endeavor to bring back is <laughs> relational masculinity mm. is that idea that you should know your neighbors who should be jelly beans, <laughs> you should, <laughs> right? You should know your neighbors. You should have relationships in other circles. Yeah. So go out, cultivate your social group, have people come into the home, find out and find more of the people that are your double chocolate cakes. Because I believe that idiom at the end of the day of it takes a village to raise your kids one of the things that we've done, and I'm, I'm, I would love to hear your take on this, is that our for in our neighborhood before we moved here, to because we just moved to Tennessee, so we were up in upstate New York, our house was the place for the neighborhood kids. Yeah. So we were, because it was always just like, look, as the door is open, we, didn't, we never typically lock the door. You know, we have, it's different here. We don't know as many people. <laughs> um, but over time, that'll, that'll adjust. Plus, we have a dog. So it's like enter your own risk kind of thing. <laughs> um, but the whole idea of the kids would come in, parents would, you know, I've, I felt people fix their lawnmower, just like regular, like, Hey, this is neighborly stuff. My, my wife says it's, I've gotten full Canadian. Um, she's like, I have these moments. <laughs> right, <do that. laughs> yeah. And, uh, but it's, it's in the intention that you become known, right. That you, you solve that isolation. You solve that, um, that negative, uh, relationship, because I think that, Part of what you said earlier was that almost everybody online is a sardine brownie. Mm. Almost, you know, almost everybody that you don't know or that you've built a fake relationship with, like a lot of the people, even I think even then a lot of people that you would see on like Reddit or forums or yeah. I don't know what, whatever, Facebook or wherever else is going Tumblr. on. <laughs> Tum Tumblr, right. The vast majority of them would be, um, would be in some capacity, some sort of sardine brownie. So in, in that regard, we need to find and cultivate more double chocolate cakes because that is an, that is a indicator, a strong indicator, not only of your capability of building relationships and modeling it for your kids, but also of your longevity because they won't be in the nest forever. Yeah. And so rather than starting over at 50, 60 on the social world, if you build a relationship with people, cultivate that, you know, it be, it. Trans, you're able to transition more into the empty nester, right? Um, I think much more gracefully. Yes. What What are your What's your take? Yeah, I definitely. I mean, it's a it's a biological human need to have connection, and this is not based in science at all. But the happiest people that I see are ones that not only have a strong relationship with their spouse, but also have a strong relationship with other people because no one person can give you everything that you need. I have friends that I go to for, hey, we're going to, you know, grab a glass of wine and just, you know, gab about the latest musky TV. And that's our level, you know. And then I have other friends that it's like, hey, something real is going on with my kid and I need you to pray for them. And that's another level. And then I have other friends that I'm like, hey, uh, these couples kind of hang out together and, and they get along well enough. We're not going to go really deep but we're going to have dinner together and we're going to enjoy our time together, you know, and having, and that's what I always, because loneliness is an ec epidemic. I, this is what I'm always talking to kids about and reminding them that high school is not forever. And so they need to learn how to be able to reach outside themselves, even as an introvert. How do you see people? How do you invite people into relationship with you? How do you cultivate that relationship? And, and decide. And this, again, the, the social sweet shop gives you that understanding of, Ooh, I was, I was headed towards double chocolate cake with this person. Like I really thought like we were aligned. We had some, some values. I thought I could really trust them. And then, Ooh, this couple of things happened. And I'm not sure that that's the direction I want to head anymore. And that's okay. I can still be friends with that person. I can still do things with them. And it may not ever reach that level. And that's, and just really understanding that there's an ebb and a flow because I think you are so lucky to have had a friend, a best friend for as long as you've had. And I will say that's not most people's experience, but when kids see their parents who have had a best friend that long, 
they think they have to also have that best friend that long. So like, okay, whoever I met in kindergarten, you're going to be my go-to for the rest of my life. And then when that person proves to be un, un, I don't know, I don't want to say unworthy because that sounds a little judgmental, but when it turns out that that's not their person for whatever. Well, I think, I think the word you're looking for is untrustworthy. Right. Because I think, you know, that's something that you and I talk about a lot is that, that concept of trust. But I think unworthy is, I think that's a perfectly legitimate, legitimate response to people. So it, it doesn't mean, it doesn't place any value on their worth, but I think the correct statement is worth of your time, energy, and effort. Right. So somebody, and I think this is really what you're talking about here is that a double chocolate cake person is worthy of your time, energy, and effort. Yes. I, I did want to say, I did not meet my best friend until I was in high school. And that was just a function mm -hmm. of my life because we moved a whole bunch growing up. And so I didn't meet him until high school. Mm -hmm. And then like we've gone, I think the longest we've gone without talking has been like a year. Yeah. And so it just, but that, that consolidated, that consolidated time, energy, and effort of high school through college, through my living there. And that in him being um, sort of a central part of my social life for the, that many years has just created a solid foundation. And it's not without effort. That's the other thing too. It's like, it's, it's not without effort. It's not without my reaching out. And it's not without my putting it in the calendar and making an effort to call him and just say, how are you? How are your kids? Yeah. Yeah. Let's get together this year. You know, and like maybe healthy conflict once in a while, when you have a relationship that long, you're going to have some hiccups where I look at things differently than you do. And having that level of trust where you're able to say, and that's very hard in, in high school, you know, because you could be committing social suicide by having a real and honest and forthright conversation. But as you get older, recognizing, you know, there are people that I barely talked to in high school that now we've reconnected on Facebook and I feel like we're really aligned and there's a potential for a stronger relationship. And I would be able to say like, I've known them for 25, 35 years or whatever. And, you know, just recognizing that ebb and flow, I think is really, really important, but recognizing the, the value of putting in the time for sure. Yeah. yeah. I, and I would rather, I'd rather teach my kids, like kind of bringing it back. I'd rather teach my kids and myself leading with trust. And just allowing that person to show me that they're not trustworthy or allowing that person to show me that they're not worthy of my time, yeah. then have my hackles up. Like I'd rather, I'd, I'd rather open myself up to the pain because as I say, I'm, I'm tough as F. It's like, <laughs> and you know, we'll feel when we have a safe space. I think that's the thing when you're providing your kids with a safe mm. space to risk relationship because they always have a solid ground to come back to. I think that's really important and helps them to be a socially and emotionally healthy person out there in the world, spreading goodness, spreading kindness, not being, you know, just walking around traumatized and wait, waiting for the next horrible thing to happen. You know what I mean? And we need more of those people, emotionally healthy individuals out there doing, doing that. Yeah. I love, I love the work, Aaron. Uh, thank you. This has been, I, I think a great conversation. If Feel Good Fathers or listeners wanted to get a hold of you or, or, or work with you in some capacity, where could they go and, and how would they do that? The easiest place to find me where I'm every day is on Instagram at Aaron Tar Speaks. So that is my handle, Aaron Tar Speaks. And I drop reels almost every day, which is like a short form video. Usually it's advice of something I need to tell myself or something one of my clients or kids needs to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So, we'll, we'll add that in the show notes. And uh, thanks so much, Aaron Tarr, everybody. Thanks for having me.